before we begin, I just wanted to give a shout out to Matthew Jensen and his YouTube channel. Matthew does some really high quality sword reviews, but not only that, some of the best sword destruction testing I have ever seen. To the points in some cases where he literally destroys his sword, so you get a really good idea of how tough the swords are that he is reviewing. So please go check him out, and while you're there, why not subscribe? Greetings, I'm Shad. And when I see any subject that I am interested in being misunderstood, an imaginary gremlin continually kicks me in the balls until I make a video to correct misconceptions. Stop it! Oh, my balls. They're really sore. So, the current subject that is being misunderstood in my opinion are fullers on swords. And for the hope to retain the ability to have more children in the future, I am going to be talking about this subject. Now on the surface, a fuller can be quite easy to understand, especially if you already know that they're not a blood groove. That, that's kind of a very common misconception that is more easily debunked nowadays. I don't know. It has blood grooves. Well, technically, it's the fuller, but blood grooves sound so much more violent. And I've not really found many people who ascribe to that misconception. But there's another thing that you might not understand about fullers, which is what I want to talk about, which is the misconception, and it really comes into why they are even on swords in the first place. And this is where I find people can sometimes get misconceptions, because they will say, and this is correct, okay, this is one of the primary reasons, it's to reduce weight on a sword. Because weight is a very significant property on a sword and it will very much affect how that sword will be used. The more weight you have in the blade of a sword, the more driving force will have in, you know, attacks and cuts, but it'll also be a bit more cumbersome, more difficult to use. And the swords that more predominantly have larger fullers, like Sverds, they still retain quite a lot of weight even with the fullers in there, and so I think it's important that these swords have fullers because without them they'd be even more heavy, and they're generally heavy enough. But what about swords with very small fullers? Because these smaller fullers wouldn't really, you know, take away that much weight from a sword. So why is it even there in the first place? Well, some have postulated that the fullers are there because they either don't remove structural integrity, and so of course it gets rid of a little bit of weight, so why not? And it doesn't affect the overall strength of the sword. But I've also heard people say that it increases the strength of a sword. This is completely incorrect. Fullers do not increase the strength of a sword. Sword. They actually decrease it. It's the complete opposite. And of course, with everything that I propose, I'm going to explain why. And the why is, comes down to basic principles of engineering. Now, when looking at the stresses that can be put onto a sword blade when in use, they come in two main forms. Stress that can be put on the edges, causing the blade to either want to bend this way or that way. And you will most often find that swords are very, very good at resisting these kind of stresses. The other type of stress is the one that gets put on the flats of the blade, which causes the bit, you know, the sword to want to bend this way or this way. And we see in very large measure that swords don't often do great against that type of stress. So stresses along the flats, not good for swords. Now, for swords that are weaker when it comes to stresses along the flats, there are certain design principles that you could add in to make them more rigid and stiff. But a fuller is certainly not one of them. In fact, a fuller takes away the strength that a sword has to resist any stress that gets put onto the flat. First of all, let's look at the stress that get, can get put onto the edges. Why don't swords often bend this way or that way along the edges of the swords? Quite simple. The width. You see, when anything bends, two forces get put onto the thing that is getting bent. Compression and tension. Compression on the side that is getting bent inwards, and tension on the side that's getting kind of stretched outwards. Now, to gain strength in resisting these types of stresses and bends, two things can be done. Add surface area to the areas of compression and tension, and the second part is to lengthen the distance of those areas of compression and tension away from the center point. And what this does, this adds leverage to those points of compression and tension, and that gives the structure a huge amount of strength in resisting these forces. And look at the flat of a sword. See how wide it is? The wider the sword, the further away the points of compression and tension are away from center, which means more leverage in resisting a bend, so swords don't generally bend 
along this plane, along the edges. But the flat is completely different, because look how far away the points of compression and tension are away from centre. They're not that far. So if a sword is ever going to bend from external stress and forces, it's going to bend along the flat. So then, what are the things that we can do to help a sword resist the stresses that can be put on the flat plane of a sword? Well, remember those two things? One, surface area. Two, distance from centre, specifically the points of compression and tension. The further you separate those from centre, the more leverage they have in resisting the stress. And the greatest example of a structure that uses these principles is an I-beam. An I-beam, as you see here, has the points of compression and tension separated to a fairly, quite a substantial degree from center, and then they also have surface area along those planes. That creates a very strong structure. What you'll notice about an I-beam is that it has been specifically engineered to resist stress and bend along one plane, specifically the sides that the compression and tension points are facing. Now it's true that a fuller in a sword does create kind of an I-beam-like structure, but you'll notice what plane is that I-beam on. The sides of compression and tension are actually facing the edges. And so this is the part about fullers that when you can put them in a sword, they don't reduce any of their strength because on this plane, along the stress points on the edges, it actually doesn't reduce the strength at all. You see, fullers in swords don't make them any weaker along the edge plane, but the flats, that's a completely different story. There is another kind of I-beam-like structure in a sword, but to see it, you need to turn the sword sideways. And this aligns the points of compression and tension, so the I-beam is standing vertical to us. But if the edges of the sword are facing vertical, then the I-beam is on its side, and this is the part of the structure that will help resist bends along the flats. So then, what can you do to a sword to increase its ability to resist bending along the flat? Well, those two things. You can increase surface area, or you can increase the distance of the compression and tension points away from center. In other words, you make the sword thicker. And this is why thick swords are more rigid than other swords in regards to bending along the flats. Remember the whole stuff we've talked about the katana? The katana is a very rigid sword. Why? Because it is much thicker in comparison to other swords of its size. So then, what happens to a sword if you remove surface area along the flats? You remove the leverage that the compression and tension points have in resisting stress, and that makes the sword weaker. And that is the truth, you see. So when people say a fuller doesn't weaken a sword, along the edges, so along any bends on the edge plane, no, it doesn't. But along the flats, well, absolutely, it does weaken a sword. So fullers actually weaken the structure of the sword. Now that is, of course, generally a bad thing, but there are things that you can do to help overcome this. One, make the sword out of spring steel. And what will happen then is the sword will bend along that plane, but then it'll flex back. So the greater weakness that the sword has to bend along the flat isn't that much of an issue, but the sword will be vibrating a heck of a lot more than it would before. And this is kind of making sense. Remember how much long swords vibrate and also arming swords and other kind of European swords? Well, it's because they're thinner and if they have a fuller, they will vibrate doubly so. And again, this is why European swords are considered less forgiving in the cut. But the way you overcome the vibration issue is by having good edge alignment. So these swords that are more prone to vibrate require more skill to be used effectively. And if you have that skill, well then this vibration, this greater weakness along the flat becomes less of an issue. But if the sword can't vibrate, if it's not made out of spring steel, well then if it bends along the flat it will stay bent and it will have a much greater vulnerability to bending along the flat because it has a weaker structure along this plane. Now there are some things that you can put into the structure of a, a sword that has a fuller to help regain some of that lost rigidity. And that is in creating ridges along the sides of the fuller. Because the points of compression and tension have far less surface area than they once did to resist the bend, but if you extend those points, move them further away from center, they'll get a bit more leverage in resisting stress. Now, I actually do believe there is some very specific engineering
engineering mathematics you can do to determine the exact trade that's happening here. Because I think, uh, you know, I'm not an expert, I'm not a mathematician at all, but distance from center has a greater effect in creating strength in a structure than it's just plain surface area. Of course, if you have both, doubly so. But do these ridges make the saw just as stiff as it once was when it didn't have the fullers? I honestly don't know. If someone is watching this who is a brilliant mathematician and knows engineering and stuff, hey, you have a bit of a project now, don't you? If I was to guess, I would say it doesn't return all the strength due to the lost surface area, but I think it would, you know, return a decent amount, just not all of it. So then, if fullers actually weaken a blade's strength, why are they even on swords? Well, one of the reasons is the weakness that a sword can receive can be overcome through spring steel and technique. And if you have that, well then, the extra flex and, you know, the wobbling that the sword will get because it's weaker along the flat can be dealt with and won't really affect the sword's performance at all. And then you have the added advantage of it being lighter. Because again, weight is a very significant component in sword design. And through my own experience and also observation, I have generally found the person who can fight faster, in other words, move their sword around faster, has a really big advantage over their opponent if there's no other significant factors coming into play. So yes, weight, very important. But there's another thing why you would want a fuller on a sword, and it's a very significant component, and it's one that we've been talking about recently. It's in looks. A fuller looks beautiful. I mean, it adds so much to this blade of the sword, like in terms of visual appeal. Look at these fullers, okay? If you just look at a sword that is flat, you know, if it's glossy, it has a bit of reflection, but yeah, okay. A fuller, on the other hand, reflects the light in a far different way, and there is so much more happening in a visual sense in the center of a blade than before. Even smaller fullers on swords and such like that, they look beautiful. And the beauty of a sword is a very significant component in its design. Remember, swords are status symbols as much as they are weapons. And the more beautiful a sword, the more status and prestige it reflects upon the owner. So, to summarize, a fuller is not a blood groove. It does remove weight from a sword's blade, but it does not increase its strength. In actual fact, it weakens it. And if the sword has no spring in it to deal with that greater weakness along the flat, well then it will bend and that's not a good thing at all. So there you go. I hope you've learned something or at the very least found it interesting or entertaining. And until next time, I shall see you later. Uh, you are so full of it. Honestly, why do they call it a fuller? It doesn't make the sword more full, it actually makes it less full. So maybe we could call it a lighter. And then if you smoke, you're all set. Well, now you can say that you are fully aware of what a fuller does. Stop looking at me, Batman. I have a sword. Seriously, though, does Batman's voice make him sound like a pervert? I'm Batman. Maybe that's how I should do my intros. Greetings. I'm Chad. I am the truth in the darkness. I am the nerd who owns swords. I am the one who never takes himself seriously. I am Chad. And that sounded a bit too desperate. I think I need to go to the toilet. No, I just had it. Shut up, Batman.